What is going on, investors? Hopefully, you guys are doing well out there. That is right. It is Friday. It was payday, and it's time for the Bank Stock Recap Show here on the Investor Channel, where every Friday we recap all the major news and the technical chart patterns from all the major Fang stocks, which just have been leading these markets higher and higher. And we better kick things off like we always do with Meta Platform. Start the week at two hundred and eighty dollars, and this stock just continues to drift higher, up nearly three percent. We'll call that to $289 per share. Now, the most serious and important topic we are going to lead with is Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg might have a battle in the cage. Yes, this is not a joke. This is CEO Elon Musk of Tesla, CEO Mark Zuckerberg of Meta, otherwise known as Facebook, potentially having a cage match. I think this all started initially on Twitter where Meta is planning a potential rollout. And we've talked about it a couple times here on the channel where they're rolling out maybe a feature on Instagram that's called Threads. That's Twitter-like and has the ability to post text and feeds in a similar manner that Twitter does. There's also been talk that maybe they roll out kind of a, a complete Twitter alternative. And I think they've taken some shots on how Twitter has been run and they view it as maybe it's it's gone off the rails to a certain degree. Now, Elon Musk said he would be up for a cage fight against Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg then responded by saying, quote, send me a location. And then Musk said Vegas Octagon in response to that. And also Musk referred to a move he is going to call the quote walrus where he simply lies on top of an opponent and does nothing. Now, I, I think some of this is done tongue in cheek, particularly on the case of Elon Musk, because if you've been following Mark Zuckerberg, who had an excellent interview that I uh, viewed this week on uh, YouTube from the Lex Friedman podcast, Mark Zuckerberg's taking his training seriously, and the dude looks good. I've seen him do his little jujitsu matches. Like I saw one of them on Instagram or whatever. I, I would not be interested in, in fighting with Mark Zuckerberg unless I did a lot of training, but I like the kind of playful nature here. But Elon Musk, the thing about Elon Musk is Elon Musk, it always feels like he's playing nine games of chess while everybody else is you know, playing a game of checkers. And so I would never count Elon out, even though he seems slightly overmatched from a physical standpoint in this one. Latest tech crackdown sees Facebook and Instagram pulling news from Canada. This all relates to the quote online news act, which forces the platforms to do revenue sharing and maybe pay for that news. And so the response from Facebook and Instagram is we'll just pull it because chances are the users aren't really going to care. And at the same time, the news outlets will lose, you know, per, maybe uh, like I have websites and I see, you know, the traffic source. I have some websites where Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are by far and away the number one traffic source. In fact, sometimes the only traffic source. Qualcomm taking a better role in supplying Meta's AR projects. This relates to chips for future products in augmented reality and virtual reality projects that Meta has going on. Moving on to Apple, start of the weekend, we'll call that 186. Finish basically flat, up just fractionally. Nancy Pelosi disclosed a buy of Apple and Microsoft. Let me get up my Robinhood account and buy, uh, what'd she buy, Apple and Microsoft? I'm just kidding a little bit. Uh, full disclosure, I don't own any of these stocks anymore. But Nancy Pelosi has an illustrious record trading these stocks, and she has large bets, like large six to seven figure bets in these trades. Where she got all that money is probably something... American taxpayers should ask <laughs> Apple, Google, and other tech CEOs to meet with the Biden administration to discuss AI and manufacturing. This will be led by allies, Tim Cook, Sundar Pichai, and Dr. Lisa Su. Earlier this year, the Biden administration laid out a formal request to comment to look into potential regulation. And look, there's a lot of different ways we can go with this. I think the number one thing is Joe Biden, and this is not a criticism of him 
in particular, you know, look, anybody his age, it's probably, uh, or not everybody, but most people his age are not going to have any clue what freaking AI is. And and so I think to his credit, and, and, and some people are going to criticize Joe Biden for, for these types of things, but I think to Joe Biden's credit, he knows this is not his lane. He knows this is not his expertise, but he does have connections with the top CEOs and he's bringing them in and listening to them. Now we have to wonder if when, not wonder, but these CEOs are going to craft and want to create legislation that only insulates their business even more. This is why Sam Altman was asking for licenses to large language models. Imagine this, guys. It costs 50 to $100 million to create a, a large language model, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars to create one like ChatGPT. Imagine if you also had to get a license from that from the federal government. Well, it, it literally just cements OpenAI and Microsoft and Google and these large companies as the only ones that can ever come out with a large language model. And so th that is my concern with these types of things, but obviously having an open discussion and not creating legislation without discussing with people with knowledge, probably a good thing by the administration. Now, Apple reportedly in talks to bring Apple Card, that's their credit card, and Apple Pay to India. We'll have several stories this week as it relates to India, including the Prime Minister of India visited the United States and were expected to deepen economic ties with that country. It looked like Elon Musk met with him. He didn't. Go, Elon Musk didn't go as far as committing to something in India from a manufacturing perspective. But this is a good, good thing. Because if we think about our relationship with China, the China-United States relationship, it is one where they're essentially Siamese twins, but they're constantly trying to punch each other in the face. I'd love for the country of the United States, and look, I know geopolitics are a difficult thing and it's too long for this show, but if the United States could actually have a, like a meaningful and not one of these adversarial relation, like meaningful but adversary relationships like we have with China, if we could have just a meaningful relationship with India, I think it benefits both countries. Now, Apple rolls out developer tools to help create apps for those absolutely spacelicious ski goggles, the Vision Pro headset. I was listening to an interview this week on YouTube from Palmer Lucky, who is the original founder of the Oculus. And I think he's, he's, he, no, he did. He sold that to Meta. I think he worked there for a period of time. Now he's making uh, like interesting kind of military defense equipment. He talked about the, the Vision Pro and, and the fact that Apple's releasing it not to sell a bunch of units, but to make it cool before, you know, maybe they start streamlining things and, and make it and lower it to a price point where more people can afford. I think it's cool, but... Is it the future of computing? I, I'm not sold on that. Moving on to Amazon. Start of the week at 126, up 2.6% to finish the week at 129 and some change. Amazon pop -pop popped as Loop Capital says the AWS slowdown likely to bottom soon. AWS is, is not in a position where they're used to. When it came to general compute cloud running primarily through CPUs, and this is like your Netflixes and your Ubers kind of pushing and pulling data and then maybe storing large data sets either in database or in just memory. Amazon Web Services has been the absolute king of that business for a long period of time. Then finally, you had Microsoft start to catch up just a little bit. Google's, you know, kind of more or less a distant third, especially when it compares to Amazon. But they've chewed into things. And then you've got Oracle, you've got IBM, you got a couple smaller players in there as well. But Amazon's still kind of the, I wouldn't say maybe the 800-pound gorilla, but they're probably still the 200-pound the gorilla as it relates to general compute cloud. That's not the case when it comes to artificial intelligent cloud. You look at some of the offerings that you can get with Google, with Microsoft, even with an Oracle, shoot, even with IBM. And there's a couple of like private companies or like companies, like cloud players that just simply aren't public companies yet. Amazon's not in that pole position when it comes to AI. They are going to capture a lot of the market. They're not gonna capture the vast majority like they did with general compute cloud, but I do believe there's probably a bottom here relatively soon. It'll be up to management communicating that 
on the next conference call. Now, I love what they're doing here with these press releases. They say they're going to invest $100 million, which is a very token amount of money to invest for a company of this size and the, the amount of revenue that they generate on Generative AI Innovation Center. This is, in my opinion, this is more or less just a rebranding of products that AWS already has. If you dig into Amazon, they've been working on, initially AI was just basically called machine learning. They have it machine learning things like at, you know Amazon SageMaker they've just rolled out Bedrock maybe a month or two ago they've had the Trainium chip they have an inference chip they're not market leading they're not overwhelmingly competitive against an Nvidia but this is a company with these types of capabilities they're just starting to package it and market it for the stock market to digest and you know look as a shareholder or former shareholder of Amazon I do appreciate it now I robot drops on the report that EU is set to open an in-depth probe on the Amazon deal. This is a just $1.7 billion planned acquisition by the Roomba vacuum maker being acquired by Amazon, which is uh, north of a $1 trillion market cap. I was viewing a lot of Amazon's robotics inside their warehouses. They used to segment out the warehouses. It used to be fenced off where the robots went and then the humans were on the other side. They've rolled out these robots that actually intermingle with the people. And I actually think Amazon's not buying iRobot to really give a crap about sweeping up your floor or even really that data. It's uh, really the patent portfolio that iRobot has is actually pretty extensive when it comes to that camera vision. And uh, that is interesting technology that Amazon wants a further protection on. Amazon is sued by the FTC over deceptive practices as it relates to Amazon Prime signups and cancellation, saying that it made it very easy to sign up and almost tricked you into signing up for Amazon Prime and then made it difficult to cancel. My guess is, you know, look, so I'm critical of the FTC in a lot of ways. They're probably spot on when it comes to that. Now, Amazon sets Prime Day for July 11th through the 12th. This is a big test of consumer discretionary spending. Every year, Amazon tends to put out a press release saying this was the biggest Prime Day ever. And, and sometimes they get more specific than that. So we'll see if we get that press release sometime on the, you know, the two or three days after Prime Day, if Amazon touts it as the biggest day ever. If you do get a sense of that, it, it tends to give the stock a little bit of a bump. Moving on to Netflix, start of the week at 430 six dollars per share into the week down roughly three percent the finished week at 424 netflix and hbo reportedly in talks to license shows over to the rival netflix is an interesting strategy changes obviously for the last several years the the goal on streaming has kind of create your own proprietary shows make people sign up i think what they're finding out is maybe the model where you make the shows and you license it out maybe that was a much more profitable venture, and so more companies going that way. Now, Paramount gained on a report that Netflix reportedly exploring an acquisition at some point. Paramount, ticker symbol P-A-R-A, -A, is a north of a $10 billion valuation. So other than kind of the hurdle from kind of a cash perspective on in that sense, you obviously have the regulatory approval that would have to come, and obviously, if they're investigating Amazon buying a vacuum maker, they're going to come after Netflix trying to buy up another streamer. Moving on to NVIDIA, start of the week at 432, drifted down a little bit, down about 2.3% finished week, close to $422 per share. Now, not a lot of news, at least from a press release perspective from NVIDIA. On Twitter, I did see that ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok, I think was reportedly spent over a billion dollars, $1 billion on NVIDIA GPUs. So that might explain why the fact the company upped their guidance last time they reported earnings and kind of shot this stock up that was already on kind of a rocket ship, shot it up even more. Because what we're seeing is the country of China cannot get the GPUs as an American company or a company out here in the West, but NVIDIA is able to alter them and modify these chips to where they can actually send them into the country of China. And the country of China is buying a boatload of them because here's the strategy. Okay. NVIDIA can't sell you the full clocked up high speed version of their chip. So what is China doing? 
They're just buying more. They're just buying more of the modifying ones. They're figuring out how to link them all together to get a similar performance of the high performance one. So how great is that if you're NVIDIA? You're like, oh, well, you know, I can't sell you this version. That's super high powered, but I can sell you 10 of these versions over here with the same gross margins. And, and I tell you what, it's a beautiful business. Moving on to Google, start of the week at 123 down just fractionally. Finished the week at 122. Gannett sued Google. I think uh, a bunch of people sued Google this week over alleged an advertising monopoly. I think it's going to be hard to prove that Google has an advertising monopoly considering if you look at Amazon's business, if you look at Microsoft's business, and then obviously you look at Facebook's advertising business while Google is still the largest it's not a monopoly in that sense, but maybe in the categories where Gannett is trying to advertise, I'm sure there are certain verticals where Google actually is the monopoly and maybe you run a few Bing ads, maybe you can run some on Pinterest or, or somewhere else, but they actually are the monopoly in some verticals. Now, YouTube's first official shopping channel to launch in South Korea. Now, I've actually signed a non-disclosure agreement with Google as it, it doesn't relate exactly to this, but let's just say Google and YouTube and shopping are going to be very closely tied. Now, Google eyes the suppliers to move some Pixel phone manufacturing to the country of India. That appears to be the country of choice as countries, again, are looking to diversify out of China when it comes to manufacturing. Moving on to Microsoft. So the week at three, four, one, end of the week down about 1.78% the finished week at 335. Microsoft boosting the prices on those Game Pass subscription and those Series X consoles. A Game Pass subscription, which used to run at $9.99, now costing $10.99. There's also kind of the ultimate version which is going from $14.99 to $16.99. I bet that all flows down to that good old gross margin. Moving on to Tesla, start of the week at $265, end of the week down about 3.3% finished week at 256. Lithium supplies may not be enough to meet the EV demand. I don't think that's going to surprise anybody. And what you're going to have to, you know, look, what you're going to have to have here is innovation. Innovation either on the lithium mining process, speed it up somehow, you know, open up more mines, get more of it out of the ground, or you got to do it on the battery side as well. And look, as somebody that owns two electric cars, and I've driven them not across the country, but I've driven across two or three states with these things. Range is overrated. Like, and I, I don't, people that I talk to, that's almost like the first question they ask. They're like, well, how much rain, how many miles can you go? And it's like, it actually does. You don't need that many miles. Okay. Because it, it, sure, sure. There are some use cases. There are certain people in the country that the more range they have would make it a more pleasurable experience or their driving habits might not be conductive to having an EV. But I would say that that is not likely the case with almost everybody. Having a lot of range is almost irrelevant for most of these cars. It actually comes down to having a place to charge it, okay? If you live at home or if you have a home like I do, I have a plug outside, uh, one of those Tesla plugs. I can plug my car in if it's low. I can top it off at night, top it off when the solar's pumping. It's not a problem, but if I lived in an apartment complex or I didn't have access to a direct plug, then it all comes down to where I, I can charge that. And, and so one of the solutions here is continue to make these cars with actually not larger and larger and larger amount of battery capacity because then you're just paying for all this might like the the price change from like a 300 you know mile range battery to 500 is 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 a fortune i mean we're probably talking tens of thousands of dollars that it adds to the the price of the car you actually don't need that and smaller batteries inside these evs is going to be one solution to the lithium supply problem. Tesla lost a bull rating at Morgan Stanley. They also, I thought this was interesting, kind of a double downgrade this week. Barclays also coming in and downgrading ahead of those Q2 earnings, which are just a matter of weeks away.
moving over to the technical segment of the show. And I just love technical patterns and I love it when they just, play, they, they, they just play out perfectly. The S&P 500 came up here, tested an area again. And one of the reasons why technical patterns, there's a couple reasons why technical patterns, they don't play out all the time. Okay. But they play out a decent percent of the time because the, the first thing is there's human nature kind of involved. This is humans buying and selling and stuff. And yeah, there's machine trading and all that stuff, but it's more or less humans making those decisions. But the number two is everybody is looking at the exact same charts. Okay. Everybody saw this was a level on the S&P 500 last week at, we'll call it 4,400 and some change. That was the area where the markets was likely to take a breath. And that's what we've saw. Don't be concerned if it continues. In fact, we could test areas south of 4,200 on the S&P 500 and it wouldn't be concerning. In fact, in fact, that is your buying opportunity. And look, you buy what's great about buying at the in an uptrend at the bottom of the range is you can comfortably set stop losses. OK, previous there's some previous lows here. More technically, they're all the way down here. Setting a stop loss somewhere in between this area is your protection to the downside, particularly if this is not necessarily like long, long, long term buy and hold type stuff, IRA type stuff. If this is, I'm putting this money aside, I want to earn a little extra on it, but I want to pull it out in two years and buy a house. I want to pull it out in two years and do addition on your house or pay for your son's education or whatever. If it's temporary money, these are excellent buying opportunities because these markets can pull back. There's clear areas where you would understand. Look, if the momentum continues negative in the stock market, there's a clear area where if it breaks through there, the technical pattern is not holding, but the S&P 500, if it holds this technical pattern that it's been in for not quite a year, but for a while, well, you should have a clear area of buying, I would assume, as we move into earnings season. Moving on to Meta. Still waiting for the bend at the end on this one, and it has not come, but look what came. We filled this gap perfectly. I hope some of you made this money. We talked about that gap up there for the longest time. We we're like, man, once you got above 245 on Meta, they were this gap was going to close. It closed. This is the like the most obvious area. Once you close that gap, there's overhead resistance literally where the stock is right now. Pullback and look, it might not be that deep. Maybe it's that, maybe it's that, maybe it's that. I mean, the pullback actually could be really steep on this one and you're technically still not that bad from a technical perspective we'll obviously monitor that but that gap is closed with meta now we're kind of monitoring for the next move apple has not bent at the end remember the trend is your friend until the bend at the end a bend on this type of thing we would jam this candle or this trend line up on there. We're looking for a break of that trend line. There's usually kind of an impulsive candle, like a big red candle off of the break. But sometimes, you know, look, sometimes these things can drift and just kind of pull down. There's usually, however, a back test back up to the top of the channel. That's also a way where you can kind of de-risk things here. I'm giving you risk management strategy. N nobody here on YouTube is risk management. It's all about rocket emojis and Palantir and 10 xing your money but these are the risk management things i'm thinking about as on apple you've gone from 125 to like 180 in six months you are going to have these pullbacks you're going to have these areas where the stock is not going to make this type of move and those are areas where you can begin to de-risk but the old saying goes the trend is your friend in the meantime amazon same situation the stock's in a very steep uptrend in fact it got a little bit steeper this week we have overhead resistance up here at 143 i'd probably pull especially if you're one of these investors that did the right thing and you bought this stock south of 100 I mean, you're looking at a 40% move in Amazon in a very short period of time. I'd probably pluck a few chips off the table as you approach the 140s on Amazon. Moving on to Netflix. You actually had a little bit more of a reversal. I would actually call that 
maybe a bend at the end for Netflix. Now, the interesting thing is this one of the first companies report. They're reporting their earnings on July 19th. Now, bends like that at the end are not an indication that the trend is over. Okay, you broke trend here. There was another break of trend here. Really what it's saying is, especially when it's a stock like this that's making higher highs, higher lows, you actually want to buy it on these pullbacks. This purple line is probably a decent indication you get a pullback to this purple line which if it happened in relatively orderly fashion down here in the 350, 360 range for Netflix. Moving on to NVIDIA. Did we find, did we finally got a little bit of an end? Got a little tiny little topping pattern on NVIDIA out there. Very natural spot for this stock and not just natural. I think it would be so healthy for this stock and the stock market if it took this breather, maybe filled this gap here at the very least, came back to the middle of the channel, come back to the middle of the channel on NVIDIA. And those are your, you know, your opening salvos in terms of adding, accumulating the position. Again, everybody's going to be looking at the same chart. Everybody's going to be waiting for that perfect pullback. There's going to be some people that kind of jump the gun. That's why if I'm trying to accumulate a stock in this pattern that NVIDIA is in, I actually start the accumulation about halfway back, which in NVIDIA's case seems like miles away at $300 per share. But just understand if you go from 420 down to $300 per share on NVIDIA, there's going to be a lot of talk about the AI bubble burst. Everybody got ahead of themselves. It's overvalued this, that, and the other. And so it's actually not going to be easy to buy the stock even halfway through the channel, let alone if you get a bite of an apple all the way to the bottom of the channel, which if it happens in kind of an orderly fashion would take you back down to about 200. I mean, we're talking about a 50%. Literally, NVIDIA could go down 50% and it's still locked in a like we're talking a, not quite a decade long uptrend, but pretty darn close. That's how incredible that move has been. Moving on to Google, definitely seen a little bit of a bend at the end here. You've had multi parabolic moves. Stock was not able to find significant amount of buyers above the $125 price tag. There's plenty of buyers at prices below as this, there's a small gap here as this stock continues to pull back. There are areas where you can accumulate Google. Moving on to Microsoft, pushed back up to the where these all-time highs. These are great places to take, you know, de-risk some things. Again, this is not a message for everybody out there. I, I don't want you to think I get on this program and I, I'm telling you when to buy, when to sell. This is the investor channel, not the please investor channel, tell me what to do. Natural psychology is when stocks are up at these level, actually this is what's get investors excited and they actually get greedy at these levels. This is actually when you wanna take some greed off the table when you've made that parabolic of a move. That is just, it's simply not sustainable in the short term or the long run. Now this purple line, notice this purple line dates back a, a relatively long time with Microsoft. You probably could even draw it in over a long period of time. Okay, a pullback to that line or in that vicinity should get you excited when it comes to that. Now, finally, Tesla stalled out at a very normal place. This actually looks like the S&P 500 back in maybe like January where you made some lows back here in December, made a series of highs, higher set of lows. Now, higher set of highs wouldn't surprise me. Tesla continues to walk back. We are roughly 30 days away from Tesla earnings on July 24th. I can't wait to bring those to you. Earnings season is right around the corner and we kick it off. Actually, next week we'll have Nike and then about a week or two after that, we'll have the larger banks. I will still be doing earnings videos here on the channel. I think there was some concern and maybe even myself wasn't really sure if we'd continue those, but we will, some of the smaller companies and, and some of the companies where it's still a valuable video, but like, I don't know, like 3000 people will watch my video on FedEx or something. And so I'm probably not going to be wasting my time posting stuff like that, but any of all of the large mega cap stuff, we will be covering those videos and earnings as they cross. Hopefully you guys have a wonderful weekend out there. Don't spend your payday 
all in one place like my wife did today. Hopefully you guys have a wonderful weekend out there. Be safe and we'll see you again next week. Good luck with your investments.